Hello, everyone, and welcome to Let's Take a Stab at It. I'm your host, John Hoyer, and with me is... Jason Barch, and I believe we are keeping the special guest train going this episode, correct? Oh, yeah. So we have Garrett Smith with us. He is a film blogger slash podcaster. He writes for Movie John, and he has the podcasts I Like to Movie Movie and Killer Bees. Hi, Garrett. Hi. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. We're glad to have you. Yeah. I hate sort of being introed. I, I don't like the entering into the conversation. Just the like, hi, as if people should like know who I am. <laughs> well, it's okay. The very first episode, I didn't realize. I thought John was going to introduce me and he had like some really nice thing planned about. You were waiting for like and, the build up and, and the he release. He just threw it of- to me and, and I was... I. I <laughs> I know what you're saying. It's just like, oh, yeah, hi. I'm oh, here, yeah. too. Oh, right, yes, hi. <laughs> this is my voice. This is what I sound like. I sound like I'm hosting a game show at all times. Welcome. We had a friend I didn't introduce, and he did like a spit take, actually, on the <laughs> podcast. <laughs> He's like, bum, 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 bum. <laughs> It's a nice way in. What, uh, what have you been watching, John? Oh, so I watched the movie Blood and Black Lace. I love this movie. Yeah, so I figured since Garrett's on, I'll, I'll, this will be the one I kind of bring up. So uh, recently I've been watching a lot of Jallo movies. So I watched like four or five movies from Sergio Martino. Yeah. And I was like, I love Jallo. Uh-huh. So I went back and I was like, well, let's see. What are some like of the like legit classics? And I see on Letterboxd, uh, you know, Garrett gave Blood and Black Lace five stars. So I was like, okay, I need to make time for that. This is, I believe my letterbox review of this movie is, I regret giving all other movies five stars because there's no way for me to categorically rate this one above them now. Uh, I I think this movie is like incredible. I, I, I love this movie. It is some of the brightest like technicolor poppy Oh, yeah. Like neon, but not because of neon signs. You know what I mean? Like so much of what I love about, uh, you know, I I really love like neon in movies and I love getting into just a nice neon sign in a movie. And this movie feels like a big neon sign that has no neon signs in it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, I I love this movie. I've been wanting to now I want to check out more uh, Mario Bava movies because like this one, like I got it on. uh so I bought the like arrow Blu-ray for it mm-hmm. and I have that as well. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful presentation on my, my new 4k TV. Um, oh, I'm so jealous. <laughs> uh, my, my stimulus is sitting in my bank account, just uh, knocking on the box of a 4k TV, <laughs> trying, to, trying to get in there and get it it's into my worth house. It. Go yeah. OLED. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah, no, I checked that out and um, you know, kind of the prototype for future Jalo movies. There's a, mass killer and he's picking off people one by one yeah. wearing black gloves yeah yeah black other gloves that. that's like that is the giallo staple kind of <laughs> <laughs> so yeah no i um if anyone hasn't seen that uh, i mean i think it's on i think it's on shutter right now so uh, yeah. i mean everyone should just immediately just go watch that just enjoy it you don't need to hear anymore. It's got this incredible two minute opening sequence where they just like do these static shots of each of the characters. Oh, yeah. Uh, and the whole thing takes place at like what? It's like a fashion boutique. Yeah. So yeah. I, I don't really know how else to say it. They like design clothing at this this place that mm-hmm. it takes place. at, And so it's like each character is in this like very distinctly lit sort of beautiful setting uh and uh i don't know those first two minutes i think are very striking and uh, i always tell people like turn the movie on and if after those two minutes you're out just get out but like i don't think you will be i think those two minutes will like just absorb you with like how dense those colors are and stuff and yeah i mean i the thing i'm excited about with your show and it's why i like that movie so much is i really do like slashers and i really masked killers i just think are compelling i don't know that's just like masked killers is compelling cinema and i think that blood and black mm-hmm. lace is like one of the better early examples of that uh it, it's like a really fun early example of that uh, on screen yeah so you were uh, you touched upon that it's kind of like a prototype of the slasher genre yeah and i was like kind of debating when i we were trying to put this uh mini series together like what are the movies to choose from mm-hmm. was this on was, your list uh no there was a so it didn't get cut it was never on there uh, no, it wasn't point. on so because it's like I was thinking like, well, that would be more of a considered more of a, like a Jalo mm-hmm. kind of thing, even though it is kind of prototypical for the future, like slasher. 
Yeah, uh, like stuff. when when you start watching Giallo movies, you start feeling like, well, so like John Carpenter had to have seen these movies, right? Like you, you start going like, <laughs> like they had to have seen these movies because they're so they really feel like the seeds for mm-hmm. what what becomes like the American slasher movie is sort of like planted with all of these like Italian crime movies. I'm like, John, have you seen Torso yet? Oh yeah, yeah. Torso, no, that's, that's kicks one of my favorites. Ass, it's so good, <laughs> and it's another one that feels like you know, uh, Toby Hooper had to have seen this movie. You know what I mean? Like, oh, it, yeah, it, it's yeah. one of those things. Well, I was gonna say, like, especially uh, Brian De Palma, mm. like, is like ta- has said like he has only seen like one Argento movie. And I was <laughs> like, you are full of shit, sir. Come on, <laughs> like, I love, I love me some De Palma, but yeah. like. It's like come come on. Yeah. Uh Dress to Kill isn't inspired by any uh, right. Italian giallo movies. It like, d- it does feel like and I don't know if it's just because of the way we consume media now, yeah. but it, you know, you watch a lot of stuff and you're like it feels like these things have to be in conversation with each other. Yeah. Like the, a lot these filmmakers are probably aware of a lot of this stuff. Yeah, and like I don't know, I love just in general just like so Blood and Black Lace, some of this other stuff. Like I just love how operatic and like yes. maximalist the yes. style is in it. And Max- you yes. know, nowadays you kind of it nowadays everything's like realistic lighting and some of that can be very beautiful in its mm-hmm. own way. But like it would be nice to kind of just have like a full like range of different like styles, you know, certain things kind of dominate for a period of time. And I would love it if we could get this very weird, like uh, this colorful lighting back. That's like, I don't know where that green light's coming from, but it looks cool. <laughs> but it's there. Uh, I mean, this is one of my favorite things to talk about in general. But uh, if I may, uh, Godzilla versus Kong is on its way out. And uh, I'm a big fan of Adam <laughs> Wingard. And he seems to be... Uh, putting those colors on full bright display in those trailers. I'm like, <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, I feel yeah. like he is kind of trying to bring some of exactly what you're talking about back. Like the guest has a lot of this going on with its like color mm-hmm. palette and stuff. Um, his, uh, his death note in particular has a lot of these, like trying to bring back, I think some of these more like, uh, a- as you describe them, like maximalist, like style yeah. choices, uh, which I, I am also a huge fan of. I, I don't know. I really, I, it, I've been going through a phase lately of like really getting into like, I guess what I would call like expressionist cinema, mm-hmm. you know, like um, Tokyo Drifter I saw for the first time recently. Oh, that's that's a good one. It's great. And is also just full of these like, I don't know, like these frames that are designed just to like look really nice on a movie screen, <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. I had a college class where we had to. What was the other one that it's not a uh, Tokyo Drifter, the other oh, uh, big one? Yeah, that, um, branded to kill. Branded to kill. So, yeah. j- I had some lighting class, and this guy chose uh, some scenes from Branded to Kill, and then we had to do like lighting shots. And Jason was so kind to be the actor in that, and uh-huh. we were like recording this. And I hadn't seen Branded to Kill at the time, so I thought the person I was working with was an insane person. I was like, <laughs> what? What do these shots mean? I don't understand how this. <laughs> works yeah. together then when i watched the movie i was like oh no this is this is amazing that's right yeah i remember that i didn't realize that was for a lighting class i don't i don't know why i thought it was <laughs> we were just doing it for fun <laughs> no no like i thought it was like part of another project uh, I, I don't yeah know. okay so yeah i don't even remember what i think we got a good grade on that i don't know <laughs> anyway thanks jason <laughs> <laughs> all right well uh jason what have you been watching this week um i watched that uh that documentary on netflix about the last blockbuster last night mm. mm-hmm. and it's it's crazy how quickly blockbusters become nostalgic because it hasn't they haven't been gone for that long i feel like mm-hmm. i don't know like i feel like there was still one around here within the last five years or so but it's become this like tourist trap almost and i believe it's in oregon and uh people come from all over to see like the last blockbuster and it's i don't know it's an interesting documentary isn't it just like in a strip mall too like, i it's think not so even, yeah yeah there's like nothing remarkable about like its location or anything it just is, <laughs> is a blockbuster in a strip mall yeah do you feel like uh, maybe this is just me being a dick but like do you feel like if you rent something from that blockbuster i almost feel like they have like no authority over you because you're like if you don't return it what are they gonna do like yeah. <laughs> Like, revoke oh, your you're, membership. You're well, like, yeah. oh, you're 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 dying. You're basically dead. You can't do anything. 
You might be stumbling into a, a truth of that business model that existed all along, which is <laughs> <laughs> these are just 16 year olds operating video stores. <laughs> you can walk away with those tapes, man. The the woman who who runs it physically has to go to the store and buy the new releases because like it's not like Blockbuster, oh. the franchise is providing them. So she yeah. goes to like Target and Best Buy that and just sense. like fills her cart. Um, I don't know. I like admire them sticking with it. And at this point, you know, it's they're beyond just being a blockbuster they're now like a destination so it's yeah. it's kind of it's become kind of this tourist trap and some of the items they have on display are like russell crowe memorabilia very specific very specific niche but it's like his robe from cinderella man and a couple other things and they're behind plexiglass so it's kind of this now it's become almost like a museum slash video rental store so it's much bigger than an actual blockbuster at this point but it's like a sh- afraid it's like a shitty planet hollywood that's also a blockbuster <laughs> yeah. video that's what it sounds like it's it's getting there like they're gonna yeah. start you know having sit down food service or something but um <laughs> they're they're not sure how much longer blockbuster is going to let them use the blockbuster name i'm not I, sure why they would care like that's actually the piece of it i've always wondered about which is like that franchise is clearly like just like gone so what do like, they have to lose like you're gonna put us out of business well but like, also, I'm I have been fat. I want to watch this documentary, and it sounds like maybe they don't even give you that much information on this particular thing. But it is the thing I've always been curious about, which is like, how is this one store still called Blockbuster? Like at this point, shouldn't they have been forced to just go by like you know Jason and John's Video Rental yeah. Palace? <laughs> Well, like, at this how point, they they're not just had the name stripped of them. You know? They're just <laughs> waiting for that to happen. At this point, I mean, yeah. like I said, she's literally just purchasing the DVDs. So it's, yeah. it, I mean, it might just be a matter of time, or it might make a comeback. Who knows? But <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so, Garrett, what have you been watching? Oh, uh, well, I watched a movie. I think I watched this last week. Uh, called. Uh, I had not heard of. The, I think I had heard of this movie once before, but uh, it's on Shutter recently. Called Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker. <laughs> that is the real title of a real movie. That's uh, awesome. It's from 1982. Uh, it is directed by William Asher, uh, and it stars this woman, Susan Terrell, uh, who I had never seen in anything before, and gives an absolutely incredible performance where she goes from like an attractive middle aged lady to like a universal monster without like any makeup. It's just all performance. <laughs> she wow. like by the end of the movie, just through like contorting her body and stuff, mm-hmm. like becomes this like almost like bog witch character. And it, it's like, <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's like one of the most incredible performances I've seen in a horror movie. That is, by the way, very cheesy, very silly. I enjoyed it a lot. They uh use a um what's the word for this a homosexual slur uh more times than i've ever heard in a movie in my life so content warning wow. to anybody that thinks they want to watch this movie going mm. in uh but it is really enjoyable it's like it's a really <laughs> crazy movie about a woman that wants to fuck her nephew uh that's not even a spoiler <laughs> that is straight up the plot of the movie oh. uh <laughs> It's really wild. It's on Shutter. I can't recommend it enough. By the way, I don't know what the title of the movie means. I made my partner laugh through the whole thing where every t- every eight minutes, something crazy happens in this movie. And every time something crazy happened, I would go, mm, Butcher Baker, Nightmare Maker, indeed. <laughs> because it never made sense to say that because it doesn't make sense. I don't know why it's called well, that. I see here on Google they have it under a different title as well night warning so maybe yeah, also, they don't even know by the way not the a better is. title not a that yeah. title <laughs> doesn't make sense either i don't know why it would be called that either interesting uh, it's I, a great movie by the way i mean it's like like i said like i i wanted to bring up the content warning because that's like very real it's it's pretty uh transgressive even for 1982 uh but it's really fun it's really fucking weird and Susan Terrell is like tremendous in it. Her performance is so batshit crazy, but in like such an entertaining way. I love movies that have like these weird titles. They'll like they yeah. just stick with you. Like I mean, I mentioned earlier, I watched some Sergio Martino, and I love the one of the names of it. Uh, his films is "Your Vice is a Locked Room, and Only I Have the Key," which <laughs> I, I believe it, is something that actually gets like said out loud in the movie too it's like it's yeah. not only is it a crazy title it's like somebody actually says it in the movie <laughs> that i mean that still sticks with me as like as like a title I was like 
That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. even well, better when they have a second title like like this one. That's not even better or necessarily mm-hmm. worse. It's just like at some point someone's like, no, we got to call it this instead. And then I feel like especially in the like grindhouse era, you have like tons of movies that have like seven titles. Because they just get like recut and remarketed like all over the world, you know, like over the span of a decade mm-hmm. at, at the time of Grindhouse Theaters. There's a lot of like uh, 70s and 80s stuff that just, you know, you look it up and you're like, it, like I go to a lot of exhumed screenings in Philly where they just like show a lot of like uh, 35 millimeter films from like the 70s and 80s. And you'll watch a movie under a title that comes up on screen and then look it up later. And it's like, oh, that's not what this is called. <laughs> <laughs> Well, even the movie we're talking about tonight, right? That has a, a different yes, title. Yes, it does. I think it has another yeah. title. Yeah. Yeah, it was a Stop Me is what they wanted to call it. Then it was also like Silent Night, Evil Night. Yeah. Which, and- <laughs> uh, you know, ultimately, because of this movie, we get like tons of uh, Christmassy titled slasher movies. Yeah, I think it was the right move. You know, yeah. you get Halloween, My Bloody Valentine and yeah. all sorts of What's that? Uh, Black Christmas shows up on Rotten Tomatoes as Stranger in the House. Very literal. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I, is, I've that, heard, is that a thing? I think so. I've heard like three or four different titles for this this movie over the years. Wow. Um, but I don't know That's, what it was. I, I don't know enough about its history to know like what the you know original title was versus like when it got called Black Christmas. Like I think Black Christmas yeah. is like what it was released with, I think. Mm-hmm. But I'm not sure. I think it was in Canada it was released like that. And then the States, from what I understand they thought it was like a black exploitation film so they <laughs> tried to name it something different but the stranger in the house is almost like a spoiler in the title right well because that's kind of here's like when i first i saw this movie in college so like uh, now a very long time ago which is a weird thing to feel uh like <laughs> i think i saw this like maybe like 15 years ago for the first time and then didn't see it for, I don't know, maybe like eight, 10 years or something. And in my head, I thought it was like, I thought the twist was like, oh, the calls are coming from inside the house, but that's not a twist. That's the first thing that happens in the movie. And you know, (laughs) that's happening the whole time. So like, even if it were called stranger in the house, it is like literally the first thing that happens in the movie is the stranger gets inside the house. And like, the tension of the entire movie comes from the fact that right. we know the stranger is in the house. They just don't, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's just get into the film at this point. Uh, the synopsis is, as Christmas break begins, a sorority house starts receiving mysterious, obscene phone calls. Shortly after, a sorority sister goes missing, and the women begin to suspect they're being targeted by a serial killer. So, you know, we already kind of went over this a little bit, but you guys are both big fans of this, and you've both seen it multiple times, and mm-hmm. this feels like a film that kind of demands a uh, repeated viewing a little bit. Yeah. So like I watched it, I think like last year and uh, initially when I watched it, I thought it was, you know, I thought it was good, pretty good. And I wrote like, I would thought it was like a decent little, I wrote a little thing on letterbox about it that I was like overall positive, but I had a, some little uh, cinematic critiques. So uh do have to point this out, Garrett. Uh, yeah. He, he did subtweet me. Yeah. <laughs> and say like basically it was implied I I need to rewatch it. Yeah. And I'll I'll come around. And yeah. I thought to myself I was like, "Oh, he thinks he thinks he's so smart with his <laughs> successful podcast and his film blogging." <laughs> I, you know, wanted to do the podcast. I was like, "I have to have Garrett on. I'll yeah. rewatch it and I'll come I'll I'll be ready to debate this." Yeah. And it turned out he was actually right, and I, I, I completely changed. <laughs> I, changed I was like, no, no, it's it's good. Like I yeah. think my initial criticism had to do more with some of the uh, shaky kind of first person POV, but yeah. when I rewatched it, it actually works really well because you can see a difference in quality between that versus the film kind of having these slow, like kind of turns down a corridor or whatever, yeah. or whatever that you can tell okay that's not the pov of the killer that's the film and yeah. I, I i enjoyed so cinematically i thought it was great i like that it takes it pays close attention to economical characterizations and that it's actually really funny like the characters yeah. make a lot of jokes in the beginning and throughout and it's um not that it's like a, a laugh right the whole time but it is like enjoyable and if you're to be like oh this is the director of a christmas story and porky's you're like eh, 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 i can <laughs> and, see uh, that 
baby geniuses or something, right? I like <laughs> yeah, it. Bob so Clark is, both of them. <laughs> Bob, Bob Clark is uh, he's a true journeyman. He's had a real, oh, yeah. <laughs> real career. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually I'm a huge fan of Bob Clark, and like I've only kind of recently become a big Bob Clark fan. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I ended up liking this movie so much after rewatching it a bunch of times over the years. I sort of sought out some of his um, his other stuff, you know, beyond like Porky's and some of the other things that I had seen and maybe am not as fond of, you know? Yeah. And uh, he has had a really interesting kind of weird career. He made this movie Death Dream uh, that's on the Criterion channel and I watched this year that is really oh, good. Right. Cool. Um, yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, he he's a really interesting director, actually. But yes, he did go on to do the, uh, you know, the masterpiece that is Baby Geniuses. And it's probably, <laughs> I can only imagine, even greater sequel. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which I assume is called baby or geniuses. I don't know the actual timeline of when the first baby geniuses came out uh, and how old I was, but I did see that in the theaters. John, so did I. <laughs> I absolutely saw that movie on the big screen. Yeah. Was that like a hyped up film? I don't even remember. I don't know. You, you just sure uh, both happened to see it. I remember being the appropriate age to see a trailer with talking babies and go, yeah, I'm going to get my dad to spend money on that. <laughs> the, uh, talking babies was like its whole subgenre in the 90s for a little bit yeah right? yeah look who's like, that talking, was like a big thing right yeah um uh bruce willis as a baby america was thrilled <laughs> <laughs> no i think um bob clark he i guess as is a, a testament to his versatility you can just see all these different films he's done the guy has very clearly has directing chops i mean you can see this in Mm -hmm. black christmas and i i don't know it's it's interesting when there's a director like this that has such a diverse filmography you know that that can kind of pivot you know i guess a modern example would be kind of like ron howard you know he doesn't have like necessarily a style but he kind of adapts to you know Mm -hmm. the the material and what he thinks is best for it so i I, I I think it's and if he has a good dp he'll you know the stylistically it'll be very good yeah (laughs) yes agreed I, I I agree with the criticism that you just quietly let eek out of your body. <laughs> John can't help it. He just yeah. uses criticism. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm very, you know, I'm naturally very negative, but I try to work on it. <laughs> uh, I'm with you, though. His Star Wars movie looked very good, and uh, I think it's because of who shot that Star Wars movie. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I was thinking of Rush because that was... Um, Anthony Dodd Mantle, I think, did that. Uh, the was the DP for that, and he has done like a bunch of stuff with I think Danny Boyle, and mm-hmm. his, those movies are very like visually interesting and very yeah, like um, fast paced and whatnot. Anyway, yeah. uh, well, but I also I I agree with uh, both you guys about like uh, Clark and the way um, you know he directs this movie, like uh, the way he uses his camera is really interesting. Um, I do think like one of the big successes of this movie, and I mean, people talk about this with this movie a lot, uh, is that first person perspective stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. I do think he does a good job of sort of clearly um, delineating between the like subjective and objective Mm -hmm. kind of like camera throughout the the movie. Um, I I actually because I've seen this so many times. I mean, I literally I think I've seen this movie like five times in like just the last like two or three years. Wow. Um, I've like watched this movie a lot. I like it a lot. Um, so I watched it with the um, the Bob Clark director's commentary uh, yesterday. Oh, nice. Figuring I could just like bring a little uh, extra context here uh, for having watched that. But he talks about that a lot in the commentary is like working very hard to sort of try and make it very clear for the audience like when we're in the subjective camera versus when we're in the objective camera. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, I, I think it is one of the the successes of the movie. Like, I mean, one of the things he's really good at is like kind of giving you the geography of the house, which is very mm-hmm. important to the storytelling. Uh, and so he's got all these like really kind of if you actually think about what he's doing, these like really complicated setups where we like the camera shows us where the attic is and then pans down the ladder and then around the hallway to show where the staircase is in relation to the entrance to the attic and the fact that the staircase goes up another level and then down two more levels and that the phone is right there at the base of those stairs so that there's mm-hmm. actually like a direct line of sight from where the phone is to where the uh, the entrance to the attic is. Uh, it's He does all that with one camera move, like very early in the movie. And so it's like within five minutes, everything you need to know for the story to play out visually has already been laid out for you in like 
one kind of actually like bravado camera move that is like <laughs> you don't even think about it that way when you're watching it. You know what I mean? Like he he has this way of like you don't feel like you're watching style. Like my my podcast, I like to movie movie. Uh, uh, the guy Dan Scully that I do that show with, he points this out all the time about Fincher is a great director to look at. Like his early movies are huge on style, and mm. so you can look at Fight Club and be like, that is a Fincher movie. And the things that happen on screen in that movie are very Fincher. But then you can eventually get to something like Gone Girl, where a lot of that has kind of been not shaved away. It's still like very distinctly a Fincher movie, but it doesn't feel like as much as like he's showing off. Those things mm-hmm. are now more just part of the fabric of the movie. Um, mm-hmm. It doesn't feel they're not like as loud. They they feel uh, toned down and kind of honed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I feel like that's like a lot. This movie feels that way to me, where it's like. It's not really showing off, but w- now that I've seen it, you know, seven times and I'm like <laughs> really paying attention to these things, it's like, man, is he like doing such cool shit with his camera throughout it. I wonder if it like with, with Fincher, if it's like, do you think he looked back at his previous films and he was like, oh, that was a bit too much. I should incorporate this in more subtle ways. Or do you think it just naturally progressed to that where it's kind of incorporated almost, you know, subconsciously almost like. I don't know. It's just interesting. Like as a as a director, if you're looking back at that, you know how that how that style evolves. Probably like the true answer with Fincher is that he. I think that dude is like a natural talent that is probably just always evolving towards being better. You know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but the joke answer is just that he's like. So, I don't know if you ever heard him in interviews. He's like such a pessimist about everything in the world <laughs> and like such a little stinker with like a little sense of humor. I bet he hates all of his movies. He watches them and he's like, "Oh fuck, the guy that made this. Uh, I just like I over need to get rid of all of this." I feel like I'd get along with him. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, no, like I, um, it's interesting you, you mentioned that just like in terms of like visual, the visual aspect of that. I also like the first scene just kind of in terms of like plot and story, it's like five, 10 minutes. And like, we get like the setup of like all the major characters, what they're about, yeah, like everything. And then once that's like, kind of like established, then it kind of just is able to kind of like, I wouldn't say it's slow, but I mean like it kind of can develop at a delib- a deliberate pace that I think is still pretty fast paced, but like it just gets a lot of stuff out of the way like immediately. And then it's like, oh, we know who that, we understand that character, you know, uh, like Barb gets a phone call. Basically her mom's like telling her, don't come for Christmas. I'm doing stuff with a boyfriend or something. Yeah. And then she's like kind of bummed out and like we kind of get a sense, oh, like her home life's a little bit, a bit of a mess, other things like that. You know, we get kind of this really good establishment of of all the characters. Is, I think it's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I, I, one of the so this movie is like I, I could talk about the craft of this movie, and I, and I would like to like a lot. But the thing that actually I love about this movie are the is the cast. Mm-hmm. I I really think these characters are like I love slasher movies and one of the joys of slasher movies are the dum dums that get chopped up throughout the course of them <laughs> but like this is not this is like uh, I don't even I feel like a jerk saying it this way but it's like this feels like the classy slasher yeah. where like <laughs> I, you know these are not a bunch of dum dums that are here to just get hacked up these feel like real women with real lives that like mm-hmm. exist beyond the confines of the frame. Uh, and like the things that they're wrestling. I mean, I think that at the time this movie came out, it, it like, you know, I think it is one of those movies that like rocks the boat a little bit for the squares and the audience that are watching it. it mm-hmm. You know, uh, I, I think if I'm right, this movie is like, uh, pre- you know, the fact that this movie is about a, a woman that is, that wants to get an abortion and is choosing to get an abortion, whether her partner is OK with that or not. That's happening at like a time in American history where like that's a big fucking topic of conversation. Mm -hmm. And that's like kind of a big crazy thing for a movie to just be about. Uh, And I like that this movie, I think this movie basically plays as like tension almost more than horror. Uh, Like Mm -hmm. this movie is very tense throughout. And as you're suggesting, John, because it establishes the character so early and so well. The tension really comes from the actual drama of their lives played out against the drama inside of the house. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's why what happens between uh, uh, Barb and Peter is so interesting and becomes so tense in those final moments. Uh, Jess and Peter. Jess and Peter. Yeah, sorry. And it's a, it's a lot more sympathetic to its characters than some slasher films are. And, you know, like you talked about the dum-dums, you know, a lot yeah. of times they set it up like 
oh, they're getting themselves into this mess. Like, oh, right. let's go to the supposedly haunted cabin for a weekend. Let's yeah. trespass here. Let's do this or that. But in this one, the danger finds them. They haven't really done anything to deserve yes. that. Yeah. So that's an interesting aspect. They don't know the full danger of what's happening exactly, but the people that they try to interact with and say, hey, mm, this seems like something's going on. Our friend is missing and whatnot. The cops don't believe them. Yeah. You know, you have like the father who is like, kind of you know he's okay but he's like uh, kind of uptight about like the posters on the wall and all he's the definitely he's definitely a bit of a square and, yeah. and <laughs> maybe a little upset to find out that his daughter <laughs> may be having too much of a full college experience while <laughs> away, you know? and like she's like and what we see of her she's kind of like a little bit of a she's a little bit of a square herself among like the group yes, yes. and like even then like so she's not even like fully partaking in like what would he would find offensive but he's still like worried about it he's like oh what you doing yeah yeah <laughs> yes i mean the movie i think is a lot of i mean this is maybe a, a very 2021 way to put this but i mean it feels like you know this is like a, a good depiction of like a woman's experience in the world mm -hmm. where like they they just have to always be looking over their shoulder and a lot of people don't believe them when they think they see something over their shoulder mm -hmm. and uh you know I think Halloween is a lot about that in an even more direct way. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think this movie kind of um, uh, I like the way this movie gets at that. I feel like it brings me into that experience in a, in a pretty real way. So one thing I want to bring up and not to and I don't want this to sound like I'm being uh, critical of people, but yeah. a lot, I think a lot of times and I'm guilty of this all the time where it's like you say like, oh, like an older movie. It's like, oh, it's so surprising how forward thinking it is. Yeah. yeah. And I guess like the one thing I always try to remind myself is like especially when you look at something from like the 70s it's like the 70s was pr a pretty radical time mm -hmm. and like a lot of people were very forward thinking of that time and you know it's just that kind of once we get into the 80s and 90s things kind of regress quite a bit yeah and Reagan it, it's kind of sets the clock backwards mm -hmm. so there's like this kind of push and pull with culture where things move forward then they go back and I think, you know, it is, it's good to note that like there were movies uh, back then that would have progressive messages, perspectives that were maybe not quite the mainstream, but it, it, it was out there. And I think that's, a, you know, always, I, I find kind of important to at least recognize that. Yeah. There's, there's always somebody that's on the right side of history, right? There, yeah. there are people that think <laughs> the right thing somewhere uh yeah i mean uh, was this a studio film uh or was it like yeah so this is a, a canadian production which means it's like relatively cheap mm -hmm. but i uh on the commentary for this clark was talking about how like it's not like his budget for this was big he still considers this like a low budget production but this was like more money than he'd ever been given with before to make mm -hmm. a movie okay. and, he, and he keeps obsessing over it in the commentary like how much he's moving the camera he's like there's a reason mm -hmm. there's a reason when you watch movies you don't see them do this that much because it's like it's difficult to do this it like it takes yeah. a lot of work to even just move a camera around a house like this like there's that great shot early in the movie i think it's when when we hear the first phone call uh, mm -hmm. and there's the shot that is kind of a roaming shot that's a close-up just over the girls it just kind mm -hmm. of like yeah. goes from face to face as they're listening to the call and uh you know he was like this is like tremendously difficult to do for like a focus puller <laughs> and, a, and a camera oh, man. Yeah. So oh, like be tight this on them close, too. yeah, to be yeah. this tight on a bunch of different faces and just sort of travel across them. Yeah, you know. So yeah, I, I do. I think that this is a studio picture, but I think it is on the lower uh, end of that. Although I don't know which studio it was. Um, I'm not sure because this was actually hard to find for a while. Um, like I remember when I watched this in college, this was not like necessarily. Any, I think it's like more recent years that this has become like, yeah, more so available. I think Scream Factory released it a few years right. ago, and it's kind of wild though, just how like some of these like movies that were like huge or touchstone movies in, in yeah. a sense that it would be like they'd be gone for like a while, and then all of a sudden like we're getting it on Blu-ray like five years ago or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, and uh, uh, John, to your point before, um, uh, on the commentary, Clark was saying like he was like, I mean, he was like, people will talk about this movie in a lot of different ways. He was like, but to me, when I made it, like, I really just wanted to put the type of women that I knew on screen. Mm -hmm. Like to me, this was not like you know, these are just like I knew a lot of women that were just like strong and independent and wanted to make their own choices and decisions and didn't feel like they needed to be like pinned down for marriage at a young age or anything and. 
He was like, I just I wanted to put them on screen. That was like kind of what I was I was doing. It's also it's just interesting. Also, kind of like just from someone who would make the movie like Porky's later about like the college experience. (laughs) And then he's got this very like nuanced to like take on like um, sorority girls and like um, I forget what the Mrs. Mac. What is she considered like the house mother house mother mother? I think that's what that's called. Is that like a thing that still exists? Like, or is it like, was it like a, well, do you, do you remember that movie with, um, uh, I think she was married to Chris Pratt for a while and affairs. Yes. She was in a movie called the house bunny. Do mm-hmm. You guys remember this movie? I'm aware of it. Aw- yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that's also the premise of that movie, which is only like a decade old now, uh, is that she's like the house mother in a, in a sorority. Wow. So I think this is a thing that has to still exist in some capacity, uh, or it, it existed recently enough in reality for them to make multiple movies that feature this uh, <laughs> this type of character. I was a little confused what her role was for a little bit when I first watched this. I'm like, yeah. who is this, this woman? I mean, I just think wasn't the idea, aware of the position. Well, I mean, I think the idea is that we couldn't possibly let a bunch of young women live in a house alone <laughs> together. Like, there needs to be someone responsible for them around. <laughs> like, women can't just own property. They need, you know, they need to be uh, controlled in some way. I, I assume that's where a role like that uh, develops. Whereas a fraternity, you know, nothing bad has ever happened at a fraternity. There's no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, why, why isn't there somebody watching the fraternity? That's <laughs> no, these these boys. They come from money. Things are good. They're fine. They're responsible. <laughs> they... uh, well, anyway, so um, let's get into the plot of the movie, which we've kind of alluded to. Um, but uh, so. So for the beginning of the movie, we uh, mentioned it earlier, but like first thing we see is the killer or I don't know what his name is actually, but like he, um, I think that just like the voice is how you would refer to him, right? Yeah. All right. So the voice, he, you see him from the outside of the sorority. He climbs up the side of the building like Spider-Man style. <laughs> like uh, Again, another actually crazy camera shot if you think about what's happening because that's definitely like a big rig attached to a guy that's climbing <laughs> up something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Uh, I just, I find that just very like, I don't know, just anything where you're doing something very physically uh, difficult, it would seem. Like for me, climbing up the side of a building, I would say is very difficult. <laughs> doing that with a camera on top of you, I would say is impossible. I know. I love trying to zoom out on what I'm seeing in the frame and just imagining <laughs> like the crew around there doing it. And everything is always so funny and silly. Well, well, I read the, that the cameraman actually built the shoulder rig for like the point of view stuff. And so it was actually his arms that were in there. So he's like, I guess credited as, you know, at least partially playing the voice or the killer or whatever. I, so I, I think that's it, true. So anyway, he climbs up the building, goes into the attic and then, you know, you see him kind of go down the steps from the attic inside and you get, you know, few conversations. I think I mentioned before, Barb's on the phone talking to her mom and she doesn't really have anywhere to go for Christmas. Claire, she's given her boyfriend a kiss goodbye and there's kind of a conversation about, you know, him eventually meeting the parents and whatnot. So then we get the phone rings, Jess picks it up and... We get the voice making some obscene phone calls. She calls over her, all the other girls, and they listen to it. And it's like we were talking about like the close up of all them listening. And it's it's interesting how there's kind of just like a mixture of emotions where like outwardly they seem like at first that they're like, it's gross, but they're kind of like acting like it's a little silly. But as it goes on, you can see that they're very like disturbed by it. And then you have Barb uh, pick up the phone and she tells him off and he threatens to kill her. Barb played by Margot Kidder, who is really incredible in this movie, I think. She's mm-hmm. very funny. Uh, she plays drunk extremely well. Uh, she <laughs> She's little, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I really like her performance in particular in this scene, mm-hmm. um, where she is trying to almost like challenge the voice in some sense. As mm-hmm. everybody else is being disgusted by it, her her response to that is a little bit different than everybody else's. And I think kind of like says a lot about the group dynamic there and how she's sort of her position within that group, right? Like within that dynamic. Uh, yeah, I think they imply that she's like known for being kind of like someone who tells people off a lot. She's like the aggressive one in, yeah. in the group. Yeah. And then as soon as she gets off the phone with uh, the killer, uh, the voice, Barb kind of insults Claire. Claire leaves. Yeah. 
We also introduced the house mother, Mrs. Mack, and a character detail I love is that she just has Sherry everywhere around the house. Not to refer back to this constantly, but uh, Bob Clark said that this is a detail from his real life. His aunt would hide wine around her house, <laughs> and that the toilet tank hiding place was a real hiding place of his aunt's. <laughs> <laughs> I remember like on The Simpsons, uh, Homer would have Duff Beer in the tank, and I was like, well, that's a little, little yeah. weird. I was like, oh, that's yeah. like a cartoon, though. But then, uh, not true. People do that. <laughs> no, <Nope>, apparently. <Yep. laughs> So then we also have Jess gets a phone call from uh, her boyfriend, Peter. And what I love about this is that we don't, as a society, a, a culture, we don't spend enough time making fun of the people that are in college who are doing some sort of like creative thing. And then they act like it's the most serious shit ever in the world. <laughs> like, it's like you have a little recital buddy or like whatever. And he's acting like, I can't hang out. I have real things to be doing. <laughs> and she's like, Hey, I got something important to tell you, which I mean, if your girlfriend says that to you, I would feel like I would want to drop everything and be like, what's going on? I want to, uh, I won't be able to relax for like a day or yeah. two or something. And yeah, he's if like, you don't oh. tell me right now, I'm going to need to clear my schedule for the next two weeks as I go into full on <laughs> meltdown worry yeah. mode. What is, what is happening? Is everything <laughs> okay? You know, and instead he's like, why are you laying this on me? I got to play my piano. <laughs> I know. Also, uh, there's an interesting thing here where we don't cut to him, uh, mm -hmm. during this conversation. We don't meet him face to face until a little bit later in the movie. And so, I mean, it, it ends up being important to the movie that they're doing this, but this is one of the ways that I, I think he's like kind of a crafty, smart filmmaker where ultimately he's going to want us to think that this kid is like one of the suspects. Mm -hmm. And so by having us hear the obscene phone call and then have the next phone call be him and us not see this guy's face and this guy be such a fucking dick to... Mm -hmm. This like really charming girl that we're meeting for the first time because like Jess is like such an incredible character. I think like I I love oh, yeah. Olivia Hussey's performance in this, and she's just this like really charming, very like smart, interesting young woman. And like he's being so mean and rude to her. And I think I just think it's like an interesting, smart thing he's doing by not showing us his face during this conversation. I think it's one of the things that plants the seed for us very early that he could be who's on the other end of the phone. Mm. Now, I got to ask you to this. Now, when you first saw the movie, did you think he was the killer? I seem to remember falling for this movie's trick that mm. I, I think that I remember falling for it. But I, yeah. at this point, I don't know. I've seen it so many times. I really can't remember. <laughs> well, well, since I the first time I saw it was, was yesterday. Yeah. Um, yeah, I. It, it kind of felt a little too obvious. Like that's what they wanted you to think. That's kind yeah. of how I felt, but mm -hmm. that might be from years of conditioning yeah. with other horror movies. That's the thing. Cause you, you almost start to like overthink it where you're like, well, was this at a time that that w they would go with the obvious answer or is yeah. that the, or is that the red herring that they're, they want you to think it, that's what it is. Right. And right. you kind of overthink it to the point where like, I, I don't fucking know. Let's just see what happens. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah Cause you're not wrong. Jason. They signpost this a lot throughout the movie. Yeah. Um, like what I'm describing right now is probably the most subtle the movie is about this. Like it eventually starts getting very explicit that like this kid might be the killer. Have you, yeah. have you thought about that? Have you? <laughs> yeah. Not well, to jump ahead too much, but it was like, at the end, they're like, you know, I can't believe it was him the whole time. And that's like, they just take it at, at like face value. Like, Must have been him. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think there was I like, I, I can't remember, but I thought there was at one point where she's on the phone with somebody. Oh, no, she's talking to the cop. Never mind. I was like thinking like, was she on the phone once with the guy? And then the boyfriend walks down the steps. But I think it was actually she was on the phone with the cop and then he walks down. So no, they actually they do do. I think you're actually thinking kind of correctly. They do do a sequence where uh, it, she get she gets one of the obscene phone calls and pretty quickly on the heels of it. He comes downstairs okay, and they yeah, even yeah, yeah. shoot it in a way where we only see his shoes coming down the stairs. Mm -hmm. And so we think we're about to finally get a reveal of the killer. And then it's just him. But then they then they want you to your brain to go like, oh, wait, but does that mean that he is him or that? Like, yeah. you know, they, they want you <laughs> yeah. to do that. That's like, yeah. And well, also, they also have like a little bit of a thing where they mention early on or whenever they're bugging the uh, the uh, phone that they mentioned that Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Mac has her own separate phone line. Yes. And yeah. 
then you're like, oh, okay, that's how this how that's how this guy's doing. That, it. It's it's just like it seems so obvious now. They're like, oh, that's you know, separate phone line, <laughs> but the caller never <laughs> never calls that line. Like, right. And you're like, that's because he's using that line. It's yes. like, yeah. Well, I think like the one thing I like had wrapped up in my head when I was like trying to first time I saw him trying to figure it out. I was like, well, what if the killer that's upstairs is different from the person who's doing the phone call? Like, it's just right. like, two two yeah. different shitty guys trying to like yes. mess interesting do stuff to the women there. And I was like, maybe that like the guy who's doing the call is Peter, and he's just a dick, <laughs> yeah. and then like he gets arrested for murder. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> but um, you know, that's what my thought was at first going into that. But um, yeah, no, it's. How creepy is that voice, though? Like that, like uh, it's really eerie. It really is. I apparently that's like one of the things they spent the most time on was figuring out like what those phone calls were actually well, going to be. I, like, I don't know if this is true. Maybe they mentioned it in the uh, the commentary you listened to, but the guy who did the voice apparently would stand on his head when he did it to give it like a certain. I I, I don't know. That's like, an did incredible detail. Land. That was not in the uh, commentary. Uh, that's, that's what I read, but uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know if it's uh, he if tied it's himself true, but... into balloon knots while he was doing the uh, the voice. It's a great performance. What, however, oh, yeah. he did it. It's yeah. I believe it's, it's awesome. actually so I did there is like a, a main voice I think but I think there are literally like multiple actors that are, are featured oh, are throughout that's how I think that's how they Thank get God. the sort of <laughs> I think that's how they get the sort of yeah. modulated multiple voice thing is I think there are legitimately like multiple actors that contribute to it um, but I do think there's like a main guy that's credited with that voice um, yeah and the, and like you said the voice does represent uh, multiple personalities I think the what are the names again I don't they have they keep right referencing a Billy there's and like Agnes. A, uh, Agnes. Uh, yeah um, and, and yeah actually in the commentary Bob Clark talked about like he's like yeah we did like we did like work on like what that story is that he's sort of telling progressively over the course of the phone calls about like this this Billy character, this like child that gets left behind. And he, you know, he was like, it, it a little bit is meant to parallel, like what's going on with Jess and Peter where they're, get, they're talking about getting rid of a child. And so there's like meant to be a, a sort of, you know, mirroring of shared trauma there or something, you know, mm -hmm. um, kind of a loose idea. It didn't seem like it was like too specific, but, um, so when the, when the killer quotes, uh, the conversation that Jess and yeah. Peter had, yeah. what, did, did that happen in the house that happened somewhere else right I like think, it, it didn't did that happen in like the piano hall or something well or that I, was in the house i think that jess is on the phone with peter in the house and so i think what we're meant to think is he hears her side of it but does he okay. repeat something that peter says that's what i thought that's why I, like I, I just now i was thinking how did he hear that if he was yeah. in the house all the time but but also um, there's a point i think where she it's implied she like retells, I think, uh, Phil about the fight and stuff. Okay. Oh, true. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, part of it is definitely we're supposed to, there's even like a shot at some point in the movie where like, and I don't even know, Clark doesn't even let on whether he intended this or not, but there's like a pretty significant shadow you can see in like a corner of the house at one point that like maybe is just the guy in the room with everybody at the time, you know, mm -hmm. like it's meant I, they do kind of imply throughout the movie that he's literally kind of like crawling around throughout the house, just kind of eavesdropping and, you know, like fucking with them basically. So after they, all the girls hear this obscene phone call, Claire is up in her room kind of getting ready for break. And we see this really cool point of view shot through like the the dry cleaner bag of a guy kind of hiding in the closet, and then uh, he proceeds to suffocate her with the bag. And it like the the shot selection in that scene is, is really cool. I mean that like you you guys have seen this multiple times, so you've seen a lot of layers to it. I think a lot of the filmmaking choices, a lot of the shot decisions, are really what stuck with me upon yeah. first mm -hmm. viewing, and that's that's one of them that I uh, I made a specific note about. Um, so at this point he, uh, he takes her body up into the attic, correct? It, it, yeah. He does it right away. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah, that, uh, the, the like editing of that, uh, kill is like, there's yeah. like two or three kills in this that I think have like exceptional, like, uh, editing throughout. And like that one is like kind of the movie in a microcosm where it's mm -hmm. like, we are shown exactly where the killer is before the character knows, which I feel mm -hmm. like is kind of like slashers end up going the other direction with all of this stuff as, as they move on as a genre where like mm -hmm. they're trying to surprise us with jump scares mm -hmm. of like, Oh, it turns out the killer was over here. 
And this movie is always like the killer is right here and she does not fucking know that. And so all of the stress is like watching her get closer and closer and closer to that bag and then him finally attacking her. And that's like the movie in a microcosm. We know he's in the attic. They don't know Mm. it. it, You know, that's a good point. And that is nerve wracking in its own way. Like we're so used to these kind of like jump scares and, you know, these sleight of hand scenes where it's like, oh, gotcha. It's just her friend, you know, coming out of the, you know, with coming out of her closet with some clothes or something. Um, Also with the, like a lot of them usually have like, there's like a chase involved or something like that. Like they barely get any time to like react to like the death of, you know, like they get killed almost instantly. It it feels very threatening in a very real legitimate way in this movie. mm -hmm. I think because of exactly that, it's like, there's no hunt. Yeah. That, you know, they've, he's already trapped them in the first 10 seconds of the movie mm. by getting into the attic. You know what I mean? Um, and, and so, yeah, it's like, which, uh, again, I don't know. It just feels like a very kind of a, a real world experience in some way to me uh, that not a lot of these movies really manage or even try to manage yeah. <laughs> ultimately. But uh, I think this one is like very successful at. So the next day, Claire's father shows up to pick her up. And Claire's nowhere to be found. And this is when kind of the alarm bells start going. And so he speaks with Mrs. Mack. And uh, that's the point where they go to her room and he sees all the stuff that he's kind of like offended by. She's um, covering that poster oh, of this, naked yeah. people with her hands. Yeah. I just, the, one of the best direct, like probably the uh, direction choices is where she, her hand's like kind of covering it. And then you see her kind of like move her hand just a little bit to fully cover the like it's a butt. It's like drawing more attention to the poster <laughs> when she does that. Yeah. It's great. There's a lot of good comedy in this movie oh, yeah. that is all like character based like that. You know, yeah. it's uh, it's great. So at this point, Jess meets with her boyfriend and tells him that she's pregnant and she's planning on having an abortion and he does not like to hear that and he's just i don't know he might be stressed out from his piano recital he's just <laughs> he seems very uptight the whole movie obviously <laughs> the, obviously the most important thing in the world <laughs> is not the well-being of his girlfriend you're gonna and- bring this up when i have a recital <laughs> <laughs> i feel like that's the way you talk is like your uh, piano recital is that important to you you're definitely not ready to have a child like, I think that's <laughs> something that should have been stated outright. Uh, I and- mean, we'll get to a conversation that he has with her a little later in the movie. But like, yeah, the, the, he has an extremely poor reaction to this information that he only doubles, triples, quadruples <laughs> down on as he gets time to think about it. Like, even when he gets a little space away to, like, go think about, like, how he reacted to this information and, like, maybe what he could be doing to, like, better respond to his girlfriend. When yeah. he comes back, he's like. Nah, hold on, bitch. I'm about to go way hard on this shit. Like, I'm really going to dig in. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's like kind of funny, though, just because of how like wrongheaded he, he is at first. Yeah. But like, if you separate all this into just being like a person trying to be able to have some sort of like persuasive argument, it's like he's the dumbest person in the world yeah. at trying to convey anything, saying like, you will not do this because any normal person would react like you can't tell me what to do it, it it's to me it seems like a not inaccurate way to depict a young man's reaction to this information uh and that is very unfortunate you know mm-hmm. um this this definitely again like feels pretty real to me the mm. the way that he reacts to her just wanting to make this choice without him and and even the way that the ultimately what he conveys about this is just that like he wants control of this situation yeah. like really what he's conveying is he wants control of this and again that feels pretty real you know <laughs> like that's mm-hmm. uh unfortunately that feels like pretty r- r- real yeah i think you mentioned in your uh your podcast episode that it was like he eventually comes up with like kind of a r- very lazy religious argument for her not to yeah the commitment level to it is so lazy that you like you can see through it he's just using like just lame talking points to get her to be able to like come around <laughs> to him and it was like yeah it's really pathetic 
Yes, um, he's got his recital to worry about, John. He's not. Yeah. He's not <laughs> formulating really sound arguments. I can't wait to talk about his recital. The, <laughs> the, I cannot wait to talk about that scene. He's such a dumb bitch. <laughs> and like, it's so funny seeing the difference between. So Claire's boyfriend, Chris. Yeah, he I think is one of the only positive like male. There's a cup there. There are two or three kind of like positive mm -hmm. male characters in this movie. And uh, uh, Chris is one of them. Um, uh, he, I think, actually like acts in a way that a, a, a you would want a man to act in uh, yeah. dire circumstances like this. So if you were to go by like stereotypical things, yeah. he would be this stereotypical himbo. Yes. He's like, he plays hockey. Yes. And it's like, my girlfriend's missing. Yes. And then he's like outraged. And he's like, well, let's figure this out. Let's go. We're going <laughs> yeah. to the police department. <laughs> yeah. And like, usually you would think it's the opposite. We're like the creative genius, the very like, he's in touch with his emotions guy he's like the bigger way bigger of a piece of shit oh yeah about like his will his way and all this and i just think it's it's just interesting that like you see that dynamic in the movie and it does like reflect like kind of how things you know uh are today with like these with creative types Yes. Being not as elevated as you would think they are. First of all, Chris has the greatest jacket in the history of cinema. Uh, I don't know if you guys clocked his insane fur coat that he's wearing when they it's go wonderful. to the police station. Uh, I know we're going to get to this scene in a minute, but when they when they go to search for the girl uh, mm -hmm. out on like the frozen lake or whatever, there's a shot that I noticed like when I watched this. I, I don't know. I think like this past Christmas, my partner and I watched this movie every Christmas, which is somehow. <laughs> Both awesome. creepy. Well, somehow both like weird and I think like not that uncommon actually. <laughs> anyway, I don't know. It's like uh, it's somehow both those. Things. But like, there's a a shot where he and Jess like kind of have their arms around each other uh, when they're out like kind of on the frozen lake or whatever. And it's very clear that that's because like he's actually a legitimately good, trustworthy man that like mm -hmm. Jess feels comfortable like having literally being like physically connected to in that moment uh, mm -hmm. and. I don't think like the other men in the movie, I don't think she would be comfortable I I yeah. in that way with them. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I yeah. think that actually signals how uh, like kind of like straightforward and good and trustworthy Chris is as a character, you know? Okay. So Jess goes to the hockey rink, tells Chris about Claire's missing this. So they go to the police station. And the thing I love is that when Chris comes in, he's like, he knows he's a tough looking dude. So he just starts kind of making a scene. Then all of a sudden, like, whoa, 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 okay, we'll, we'll help. We find out at this point, another girl is missing too, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They, there's been, and it's maybe like a younger girl. I can't remember. Yeah. They, I think it's implied that it's a younger girl, but I, I don't know why I think that. Yeah. I think she was like, I thought she was 13. If yeah. I right. Correctly. She's like a teenager. I thought so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you hear the mom talking to somebody about, you know, what's going on and that she like went missing and stuff. So then we get uh, the introduce John Saxon. I think he's like a pretty good like his character is also a pretty good, like a decent guy. Yes. Like, I mean, he like he actually listens to these girls like once mm -hmm. once uh, Chris gets his attention, he mm -hmm. like takes them seriously. He doesn't treat them as like they're being ridiculous for being panicked about these calls or anything, right? Like, and actually, and he dresses, and he dresses down his uh the the guy at the front, Nash, who was the dumbest yeah. cop in the history of uh, cops, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sergeant Nash. Yeah, <laughs> there's that whole fellatio joke, which yeah. is another just great Margot Kidder performance moment. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I love how drunk Barb is and like <laughs> throughout the whole point, she even <laughs> takes out a drink while she's there. Yeah. So then we, we were treated to Peter's recital, which oh, I'm so excited to talk about <laughs> this. Okay. Thoughts for this. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I, I need to legitimately know what you guys think. Are we supposed to think that he's really fucking up so bad? Like that what we're hearing is him really fucking up. Cause he's like sweating, and he and by, the, and by the end of it, he is obviously very upset with his performance, right? Mm -hmm. Like he definitely doesn't think he did well. But are we the audience supposed to think that what we're hearing is him just somehow? It's as if like the stress of what's happening with him and Jess has caused him to have like 
endless muscle spasms across the keys <laughs> or is he playing a particularly like kind of wild piece mm-hmm. and like because like I-, I don't know like every time i watch this scene i can't tell the piece itself is like strange but uh mm-hmm. it seems to require a lot of actual like physical prowess <laughs> to be played like even yeah, as strange right. as it sounds what i hope or what yeah. i want to believe is that he's actually like really, really bad. Right. So all the seriousness beforehand is really funny. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's him, even even without the abortion stuff, that's how his performance is. It would have been right? like that exactly. anyway. Like he's <laughs> yeah. just a he's just a dumb bitch. So like that's the, what sound I would want. Of, the sound of it to me is like if Bill Mur- if a Bill Murray character sat down and was like, <laughs> I'm gonna play a professional piano yeah. recital. Like the sound yeah. of it is like really calamitous and strange mm-hmm. but to actually watch him do it it's like mm-hmm. I, it looks like you're doing this well i, I don't yeah. understand yeah. what's happening yeah. like i don't know what the movie wants me to think about this moment every time i see it i'm very confused well it's like well, also it it kind of is like that a little bit uh, did uh, either of you see the king of comedy yeah okay so when he's doing like his stand-up routine yeah it's like I don't know if you're really supposed to think this is like dynamite material, okay material, bad material, because it's hard to know like late night comedy as a very particular style. Yes. So is it is it very good for what he's trying to be or yes. is it just like hacky jokes and like this is what he wanted to do all this time is these like lame jokes? Like it's hard to know the intention kind of. Yes. I, so, I, I know because there's a read on that movie that what what is twisted about the ending is that, oh, he's actually good at this. Mm-hmm. But there's also a read that like uh, what he's doing is as bad as you would expect from a guy who's been doing this in his basement onto <laughs> like <laughs> you know what I mean. Uh, uh, and I don't know. The problem is that I don't necessarily know the movie's perspective on that. But that's also yeah. not a problem, really. That's kind of what's interesting about scenes like this. Yeah, I sort I- of like that I don't exactly know what the movie wants me to take out of this. You know. It's clear that he's upset with his performance. And yeah, that's we at least matters. know how, how Peter feels about it. Because yes, he smashes yeah. the piano, a very expensive piano. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Which is like, what kind of rich person is like, you know what, I'm going to destroy the piano well, at the, the conservatory. Property. Yeah, yeah, 1,000%. Like, <laughs> that is not Peter's piano. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's not even Peter's mic stand to smash into the piano. <laughs> Yeah, I I like this performance too. Uh, what's this guy's name? He's in two thousand one. Um, Kier Delia. He he's pretty good in this performance because, like, again, it's like for you to buy sort of the final moments of the movie. Mm-hmm. He's got to be exactly the right, uh, believably slimy piece of shit. And I he right. just kind of um I don't know. He does that in an effortless way that I that I like. Let's see. Okay, so. The next scene we see uh, Barb is really drunk talking to Mr. Harrison about turtles having sex and going to the zoo and watching them have sex. And they're like, all right. Another great Margot Kidder performance <laughs> moment. What I actually, I read about that, uh, that story she tells. It was, the intention was to make these feel like they're like older adults. Cause I guess the, the story was originally supposed to be like slightly younger kids younger school age kids yeah and like i guess that they know this story that she tells is like oh like you know she's she's an adult she could talk yeah, about that's that's how we know these are women of the world yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah she knows that turtles fuck she's an adult <laughs> <laughs> uh she's amazing she's so great in this moment have we also there's like that moment where she's like literally giving like a little kid like alcohol at a party <laughs> like in yeah, the background yeah. of a shot <laughs> <laughs> what she's was like, that Calvin. what what was that because the one dude santa claus and he doesn't want to be there and he's yeah like... i don't know it's like it's it seems like it's some sort of like the sorority is like raising money somehow by throwing like a i don't know like a uh pictures with santa type thing i don't like, know i'm just thinking of like all the whatever sorority houses or frat houses at a temple and trying to picture the parent who would just let their kids go there yeah and i like i can't imagine a, a modern day event like that but no. maybe it happens <laughs> I don't know. just a bunch of little kids sorority house but yeah so barb uh she goes to bed because she's been drinking yeah and then pretty much everyone else in the house except mrs mac they go out to be a part of the search party and we're left with mrs mac she's getting ready she tells them she's going to be leaving for the holiday and as she's packing she i guess is looking for the cat 
And yeah, right. Claude? Is that the cat's name? Yeah, I th- yeah, it's Claude. Yeah. Your memory is better than mine. Uh, you've seen it a lot more. <laughs> I've I guess. seen this movie a lot. <laughs> but, I can literally hear her in my head going, Claude! Claude! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So she goes up the steps into the attic and she sees Claire and this was like, I think this shot's very interesting. So like we see the point of view of the killer of the voice holding the uh, crane hook or whatever. Yeah. And like we get that point of view and then like he drops it. And so we know it like hits into her, but like the shot like below where we see her feet. Yeah. Like kind of get, it's like she gets lifted up. Yeah. And like, pulled out and i i just think of like so it's almost like it like hit into her but then also like pulled her up it's very like it's it's definitely the probably the biggest stretch of like suspension of disbelief in the movie (laughs) right right? like this is probably the furthest the movie gets into like something that you're like wait what like you know the logistics of it are like Mm -hmm. stretched pretty far yeah actually in the commentary clark comments on this is like one of the things where he's like I kind of wish I ins- I inserted like another shot or two here to like kind of clear up logistically more like what's mm-hmm. happening here. Yeah. Which like in his mind was more like she gets knocked out by that hitting her and then the guy like pulls her up. Okay. Okay. But because of the way the shots are arranged, it, it really like does that, look yeah. like he hooks her and then like pulls her up with the hook kind of. Yeah. That's what I was wondering. I thought maybe yeah. he had like pulled the other side of the string and it right. kind of like. What yeah. hung her up higher or something? I was like, I mean, I know it's a little silly, but I also was pretty disturbed by it. So, like, I I, what <laughs> is that hook though? Like, what is what is? Yeah, what would you need that for? In yeah, attic? in the attic. <laughs> you got me, man. I, maybe that's how you get a. I don't know, like luggage up into the attic. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't, don't know. I do not know. Interesting. I didn't. I wasn't sure if it was like to pull the staircase up, but then that doesn't. Really yeah, I mean, sense. the way that's the other thing is the way that's designed is it just has that like ladder that's just sort yeah. of built mm-hmm. in there. You know, it's like not. Yeah, I don't know. It's really interesting, though, like I how much mileage they get out of like the shot of like Claire dead, but like with the bag like in her oh, mouth. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, I just find that so disturbing. Yes. And like it's a very <laughs> striking image. It's one of the things that I really remembered most about this movie, having seen it that like one time in college. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like I, that that image of Claire in the attic window is like something that I I don't know like uh, lives in my brain. And it's just jarring too, like how the bag is pulled so far into her mouth. Yeah, like that really stuck with me. It's like her, her like final gasping breath. You know, it's yes. not just loosely kind of hanging yes. over her mouth. Mm-hmm. It's like sucked back in. Yeah. It's very disturbing. It, yeah, it's, it's like a, a really a, chilling image. A physical representation of her last breath, more or less. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so at this time, we got this search party that's looking for the other missing girl, right? Yeah, the 13 year old girl that's missing in town. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they, at this point, they happen upon it. And I believe this is the shot. I, Garrett mentioned the editing earlier, but there's a, really cool shot where the woman screams and her scream cuts to the telephone ringing like that's yes. awesome that, there's uh yeah. there's like multiple scene transitions in this movie that i think are wonderful and i yeah. didn't even you know it's the kind of thing that i definitely didn't notice until i watched it like a fourth time uh there's one time where they're screaming that cuts to like a guy like hollering into the window like <laughs> to try and get it he's like looking for someone to come open the door uh mm-hmm. so it's like yeah there's a lot of really good sort of clever crafty scene transitions like that is that the one where it's like a wreath and there's like a he's all yeah. distorted and like yes. the glow you, you yeah, hear yeah. screaming that then cuts into like his mouth which is open in that distorted yeah. window <laughs> thing it's great yeah, yeah it's so cool so we get jess she comes home from helping out with the search party and she receives another obscene phone call. We mentioned this earlier, but uh, so then she decides she's going to call the police. And while she's calling the police, the uh, her boyfriend, Peter, comes down from upstairs for some reason, instead of just sitting in the living room like a normal person. <laughs> yeah, there's there's an interesting there's like a shot before this where we see him like outside of the house, like just sort mm-hmm. of like lingering outside. And uh, it's another place where it's like, it feels like there's like a little bit of shoe leather that maybe they cut out and should have left on that might have mm. like indicated where he moved, you know, how yeah. he m- moves from one part space to the next. But it also, I think that again, contributes to what they're trying to misdirect us towards mm-hmm. is that we, we see him outside the house, then we see him coming from inside the house and we don't know where from inside the house he came, but we know where those calls are coming from and, you know. 
Yeah. He's and just looking for a piano to punch at this point. He's just <laughs> going around. <laughs> piano but, puncher Peter. <laughs> <laughs> So then he's like talking to Jess and he's like, all right, so I left the conservatory, which I want to know, did he actually like leave the conservatory or was his like, I'm leaving just destroying the piano and, and walking out. Like, I don't think he formally uh, left withdrew from the school. I don't think any papers were signed. I think he's still just, (laughs) he had, he had his his big triumphant moment alone and no one else knows about it. He's like, He's like, I left the conservatory. Like, no one has even discovered the broken piano yet. You know, like, no one has any idea he's gone. I fucking told them. (laughs) So then he tells her, like, oh, yeah, left the conservatory, and we're getting married. (laughs) Yeah, it's kind of like, by the way, we're going to get married. This is the quadruple down moment that I was referring to earlier. Where He's like, okay, here's... He's like, I thought about it. I spent some time thinking about it, and I have a much better, more measured response than I did yesterday to finding out that you'd like to abort our baby. How about instead, I quit school. I get a dumb job I don't want. You have that baby. You support that baby from my kitchen. I am your husband. I control you. Like He's like, he just fully goes into this like... I've I have written out a future for us together and it's like me you we're getting married we're having this baby I'm going to quit school it's like all the things that she clearly doesn't want <laughs> like it, it's a uh, such a terrible proposal just yeah. on top of that like <laughs> yeah I mean that's the other thing it's like you watch it and you're like dude you are such an irresponsible moron like you're yeah. 22 years old <laughs> you don't know what the fuck you mean when you even say this like none of these words even mean anything to you you're like we're gonna get married you don't know what that means you're like yeah. we're gonna have a baby you're like you, you don't have any idea what that I'm means gonna, like these are i'm gonna say i think a baby is a little more complicated than a piano. Yeah. And we saw how he treated the piano when it didn't yeah. work the way he wanted it to work. So. Peter just doesn't have control over anything. <laughs> no. He's like losing control over everything. So he's like, well, yeah. maybe I can control Jess a little bit. Right. But it's, yes. it's like if he's trying to manipulate her, which he kind of is, like at least do a more heartfelt proposal. I mean, obviously, it's pretty spontaneous. I don't think you know, before the recital, he was planning on proposing or anything. Right, right. Yeah. You know, I think he just, he's like, all right, this is what we're going to do now. And it's, it's like, he's like just telling her they're going to get married. Like, I don't know. Yeah. He, well, and he's go, it, it's, he's doing that thing where like, um, you, you know, uh, sometimes you panic and you try to control things. Right. And like, mm-hmm. so I think that this is his like very toxic, like very kind of like patriarchal masculine version of that sort of panic response of like going into quote unquote, like fixer mode. But to him in this moment, fixer mode is like, I need to be in full control. I need you to like serve these <laughs> roles yeah. in my life in order for this to like continue on. Uh, it, it, uh, and like, yeah. she's like trying to say like, well, I have like, you know, hopes and dreams of my own, buddy. I want to yeah. do these other things. He's like, you can still do them. I'm just going to be there just holding you back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And then, so they fight and then she says uh, you know definitively i am getting the abortion Mm -hmm. and uh you can't stop me and then he tells her she will be sorry well it's interesting to your point about like him this is like a terrible like what is he even doing none of this is even a good argument like how would this sway her (laughs) you know like he's not being very persuasive the only thing he does succeed at is gaslighting her i mean this movie you this movie could just literally be called gaslighting like Mm -hmm. you know the only thing he actually succeeds at is making her think he could be the person on the other end of the phone. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's the only thing that he gets out of treating her this way and, and acting like this in response. And um, I think even you have Phil uh, says something at one point that she doesn't believe that it's Peter on the other end of the phone, but also lets known that she thinks he sucks. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. Well, we all know he, how I feel about, this piece of shit but i don't know if he's <laughs> that big of a piece of shit john is is peter our first weenie of the new miniseries oh yeah he, he's a he's a huge weenie oh man what a boy you nailed it i mean I, i've seen this movie so many times never thought to call him a weenie and you just he just lasered in on exactly how to describe this character. he's a real fucking weenie 
So then we get uh, Lieutenant Fuller. He shows up at the house. Uh, they bug the phone and decide not to bug Mrs. Mac's phone because because <laughs> the killer's the, never called there. Yeah, he never calls that phone. Do you are you guys familiar with this actor that plays the phone guy? His name is um, uh, Leslie Carlson. No. He is a big David Cronenberg guy. He's in a ton of Cronenberg's movie. He's a Canadian actor, so he's in like mm. a lot of these Canadian productions. And uh, have you guys seen Videodrome? That's I have. Like, that's well, my favorite Cronenberg. He's the guy that like runs the company towards the end oh, of the okay. movie when okay. he like yeah uh that's this guy that i think his name's bill graham in this movie is the character's name mm -hmm. which i think it's funny that uh graham is the name of the guy that's running the telephone uh <laughs> thing in, the, in this movie yeah um but uh yeah he's this guy's like a great character actor and i love one of my favorite things in movies is process anytime yeah. we're just showing me a process in movies i fucking love the way this telephone thing almost turns the finale of this movie into like an action sequence yes, mm -hmm. yes. it's really really clever what, what i like is is how it gave some insight into why you have to keep them on the line so long yeah, yeah. because that became kind of a trope in itself like yes. with the the bugged phones like you got to keep them on and then to see this character kind of scrambling i don't even totally understand what he was doing but me neither he's just... like somehow physically tracing the line i guess yeah. mm -hmm. but i don't exactly get it yeah but like usually in most movies it's like they hit a button the trace button and then it's like loading and that's all yeah. we have right. whereas this is the guy's like holy shit where the fuck is that yeah. like he's like going around doing it and yeah. i love that it's yeah. no you're right because like i love process stuff too like in movies um i think i've seen like some uh, people online call it like competency porn like just yes. like people really good at their jobs <laughs> yes and, <laughs> so the the cop lieutenant fuller and them like they're gonna try to trace the call and like it's not like they're fuck ups it's just like okay we just need to keep them on a little longer and yeah, like yeah. we can do this and he calls uh Jess and kind of reassures her about certain things and he's like you know hey like you just got to try to keep him on a little longer and like she seems upset like well i'm trying but it's it's difficult to t yeah. listen to this and he's like yeah i know like he's he's being yeah. empathetic to it and stuff so i think that's like a really i don't know that stuff's all very strong yeah i uh john saxon is one of my favorite uh character actors uh i guess he's not really a character actor but um Mm -hmm. uh, genre actors I guess uh, and I, he's like such a good strong presence in movies and I, I really like the way he plays this character I actually especially love that scene which I think is I think it's somewhere right here in the movie where they're going back and forth and kind of like figuring out the fellatio thing yeah. you know what I'm talking about where they're like they're yeah. responding to that thing with Nash it's like him and that laughing cop <laughs> whose only role in the movie is to just like giggle at everything that's happening that's who I would be yeah. <laughs> uh, it's really really a fun scene that just kind of lets him like kind of have fun performing as like an actor you know it's like mm. it's not really necessary to the movie but it gives a lot of flavor to these characters oh yeah uh, I, I like it a lot and I like how like, Nash's like response at the end is like, oh, is this something dirty? Yeah. It's no <laughs> Thomas. <laughs> it's probably the biggest la laugh line of the movie, actually, is <laughs> how long that goes on for him to still be like, oh it's something dirty like to still be that kind of like you know dense about it like it's really good okay so the next scene we're on to which is probably i think is probably the best scene in the movie and it is the barb's uh death scene yeah which garrett mentioned to me uh pay attention to this scene watch it twice <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you didn't give me that note you didn't tell me to watch it twice he told me to watch it twice. Jason. <laughs> you, sh you should have passed it along. Well, uh, as maybe my homework. he assumed you could like interpret it fine once, but he talked with the meaning of eh, John's a little slow. So he needs to I watch just, it twice. I always <laughs> tell people to watch that sequence twice because I think it's like I, that's like my favorite kill in the history of mm -hmm. like slasher movies. I really, really love that kill. I love the way it's edited. I love how kind of like impressionistic it is like it, it mm -hmm. you're not even the way the shots are constructed and edited you're not even entirely sure what you're watching like you are you know what you're watching but you don't quite see what you're watching mm -hmm. it's it's really really interesting and i i think it's like very beautifully shot it's got a lot of like 
really uh, extreme close ups uh, on glass that's like reflective and mm -hmm. uh, just I don't know. It looks very interesting. I, I, I love that sequence. So like what happens like a little bit before that we have the voice goes into Barb's room. She wakes up and then like the voice kind of hides as uh, Jess goes to check on Barb. We have the carolers come. They knock on the door. Yep. Jess leaves to go listen to the carolers. And what I like, I guess what I think is really great about this scene, um, and it's probably obvious to everyone, but like, so the title of the movie, Black Christmas, it's kind of like trying to mess with like the, the feelings that you associate with Christmas and like kind of this very like nostalgic, nice time. And like the movie is kind of like bastardizing that. So then you mm -hmm. literally have carolers singing the Christmas songs and then it's like intercut that with like a brutal murder. Yeah. where you see like the unicorn and i i think um i mean it's not really explicitly stated but like the unicorn glass and like those other things that are on her uh bed i'm assuming must be things that she had when she was a child sure they're like items from home at least right yeah Probably, or whatever like... so it's kind of like things that have a certain kind of more positive kind of meaning to her and her life mm -hmm. and whatnot so like it's kind of like you take you're taking like this unicorn uh, and you're stabbing her with it and like that just is like just like kind of just bastardizing like the this like kind of uh, beautiful little item that she has yeah so I just you know I love that scene and it's like like you were saying about just the way that it's like cutting between these like very interesting shots through the glass and the reflection and all that and it's like yeah, yeah well this is like the highlight of the movie highlight of like one of the best slasher kills yeah yeah, and well, again, that, again with the editing too it's just yeah. like it's so unsettling just yeah. cutting back and forth it, it's also interesting because like um the way it's edited and stuff we don't even see anything that graphic i mean mm -hmm. slasher movies right. part of uh, and it's one of the things i like about them too is like they're gory they're you know they're like really gory and this movie is not very gory um, e even when we're seeing, uh, like this is a pretty, I guess you would say graphic kill. Cause we're definitely watching a woman get murdered in this scene, but like, we're not really like the way it's put together is we don't actually have to really see it happen. We, mm -hmm. we more feel it happen. And that kind of is more impactful in some way. I think it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's very interesting. And, and I actually, I love the, uh, the inner cutting with Jess as well, where she's like, bathed in that red light from the mm -hmm. uh the christmas mm -hmm. lights throughout the the whole sequence and her her just her facial expressions in that are great because she's like she's taking in these carolers and she's very she's kind of happy about that but you can still still tell that she's like unsettled about everything else that's going on around her and she's like kind mm -hmm. of she's kind of standing in the doorway like half of her mind is kind of inside and then half of her attention is outside and yeah. i think we we see that that kind of cross-cutting juxtaposition a lot these days and sometimes even more exaggerated in, in terms of you see something, one character doing something very horrible and then juxtaposing it to something very like innocent, like, you know, the carolers. And, you know, that's for, for a decision like that to happen in the seventies, the I think it was like, it was a really cool filmmaking decision and an editing decision. So Jess goes back inside, she gets another obscene phone call and he hangs up pretty quickly. Lieutenant Fuller tells her to keep try to keep the guy on the phone. She then gets a very distressing phone call from Peter. Yeah. Telling her not to kill the baby. He's very desperate. This is another connecting thing, right? Where he's talking about don't kill the baby and all the stuff we've been hearing in the voice calls are about a baby being killed and stuff. Like mm -hmm. they're they're doing these sort of like trying to draw more of these, you know, signposting this like connection between Peter and the killer. Yeah, and Lieutenant Fuller is kind of we see him making these connections this whole yeah. time. And I and I like that. So he he calls up Jess afterwards asking her what that's about. And she seems a little mm -hmm. bit uncomfortable by that because she's like, oh, you heard that. Right. And so obviously I think she feels a little bit like her privacy was a little destroyed there. But it, you also see that like Fuller's coming from a place of like, it seems like he's like wondering, like, is something going on with this guy that you need to tell us about? Because maybe. Yeah, he's, this is investigation work, right? Like, yeah. that's why he's asking those questions, I think. Mm hmm. And she also wasn't quite honest with him before yeah. when the voice was kind of going back over the conversation, kind of reciting the conversation that she had earlier. She was like, right. oh, that was that was nothing. So then we see 
Phil goes into Barb's room and we get we kind of hear like the killer. It sounds like he closes the door. Yeah. It's such a like kind of a subtle moment that I like later on when like Barb is or when you see uh, Phil is dead too. I was like, wait, when when did she get killed? Yeah, I was mm. that, I was so surprised by that. I feel like she deserved a little better. That's all I'm saying. But yeah. uh, <laughs> but it was like it, it was interesting just how like it's it happens. You see it, but it's almost like it doesn't really register fully till later. So then we have Lieutenant Fuller goes to the music conservatory and he sees the destroyed piano and thinks, yeah. oh, this is a little fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, I guess that kid must have quit this school. He sure <laughs> showed them. <laughs> um, okay, so then we're kind of getting to the end here. And so Jess receives an o- another phone call. And then what we said earlier, you know, we see like almost like an action scene yeah. of them f- tracing the call. And wouldn't you know it, it's coming from within inside the house. Yes. Oh, which from I, inside the house. I looked it up, and I guess this is the first movie that did that. So yeah, it, yeah. it's definitely one of the first ones because there's also like um, when a stranger calls, which I think is maybe that's not from inside the house. I can't remember, but yeah, mm. there's like a few movies that did this. I think I think you're right that this might be the first one that did it. Yeah, because I looked at I think when a stranger calls is like a year or two later or okay, something. It might be, yeah. I love when I, there's like a trope and then you watch kind of like one of the first foundationary movies of some trope. Yeah. And you're like, oh, so that's how it works. But what's interesting here, though, is like we kind of already knew that was happening. Yes, exactly. So, it's like it's not like the reveal. Yeah. Like like when I I think it's when a stranger calls is the one that like that's like the big like it's coming from inside the ha- I can, or no. What fucking movie is that? There is a movie where that's like the big reveal. This movie, it's like, it's a reveal for the characters, but not mm-hmm. for us. We've known that the whole fucking time. Yeah. So, and then what I thought was cool was, so she finds, uh, Nash tells her to get out and tells her, don't get your friends. And instead she goes and gets them, which I guess, I don't know if I would have done that. <laughs> I love, I, this is so, I mean, this is one of those things that maybe it's just like you watch this movie enough times and every decision becomes like a good decision. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, but, uh, I really love that Jess is like, this is, this to me is like the defining moment for Jess as a character. Mm hmm where she cares about her friends and so she's going to try and help her friends because as far as jess knows they're just sleeping upstairs Mm -hmm. you know like she's not aware of the kind of danger she's in like she doesn't really know how scared to be but knows that her friends are in danger based on what she's just been told and thinks she can help i kind of like this and yeah her screaming for their attention is so great there's so much desperation and that she just really wants them to answer. I yeah. it, personally, I don't know the best move. I think it was a good move for her character. Yeah. But if I'm screaming up the stairs like that and no one's responding, I might just leave it to the cops at that point. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. They're more resourceful. They're, they're better equipped to handle this. Yeah. Okay. So, Jason, yeah. I'm staying over your house. You get that oh, phone call. Here we go. Okay. Are you going to yell? Are you going to yell to me? Or are you going to go? Talk to me. Tell me, like, hey, I, there's a guy. I here. will <laughs> yell. I will yell to you first. <laughs> Better respond and say I'm good. <laughs> but then again, who knows? The killer. The killer could have like a knife to you and be like, just tell him you're good. Tell him you're good. I don't know. I'd, it, it, when you put it that way, I'd I'd probably come check on you. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. She had a good weapon, I, at least I, the the fire stick poker. That's a uh, well, yeah, the, the the fire poker. Yeah. That's the that's thing. Uh, it's like, you know, she uh, she's smart, right? Like she grabs a weapon. She's like classic. She's, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, well, I don't know if I would have done that for you, Jason. I would have yelled maybe at most, but <laughs> you just you you wouldn't really feel like going up the stairs. You'd be like, well, the front door's right I'll te- here. I'll text him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll text him. <laughs> you, yeah, you, you call me. Get out. <laughs> you, you call me, and I answer, and you can't resist like just messing with me, and you do the voice, and you're like, I'm just kidding. <laughs> like the cops say, come outside. He's in the house. Like, if what? anything, if anything was to happen like that. Well, the real thing that would happen is I call you, you asshole the call <laughs> and don't pick up. And I'm like, I did the best I could. I tried. He's gone now. <laughs> <laughs> so she goes up the steps with her fire poker, which is, you know, cool. And she uh, finds the dead bodies 
And then she was it. Doesn't she hit him with the door, like hits into the door and hits into him? Yeah. Well, there's that great shot of just the oh, eye. Yeah. 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 yeah just and, little... uh, it's it's also like it's red. Like it the way uh, or at least uh, on the Blu-ray I have, which is like a, a pretty I think it's like a 2K scan of the movie. It looks mm-hmm. really nice. Like the eyeball is like red in a way that is like very frightening when yeah. you actually like kind of I, like it. It definitely is not something I noticed the first couple times I watched the movie. Like, I, I don't think I totally clocked that it was this like kind of unnatural color. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, watching it the last couple of times, it like it, it's like an unnatural red color that literally looks like supernatural evil on yeah. screen. You know what I mean? Like it, it's it, it's pretty interesting. I'll tell you what, it pops in 4K, Garrett. It yeah. pops in 4K. <laughs> Gotta get that TV, baby. Gotta get that TV. <laughs> so anyway, so he starts he starts chasing her, grabs her hair as she's going down the steps. Yeah. She gets into the basement and she locks the door and then the next thing we see all of a sudden peter starts knocking (laughs) on the window like jess is that you jess are you okay this is definitely to me the weirdest thing in the movie where i'm like (laughs) i don't fully understand peter's motivation in this moment to punch (laughs) through this basement window like because also i'm pretty sure the cops are literally right outside like i I just like i don't exactly understand like what he's doing throughout this sequence (laughs) like if you didn't want her to think that you're the murderer you are doing everything possible to like not make that happen it's listen he's he's that worried about the baby yeah, yeah. See, he needs to make sure oh there's a murder spree oh i gotta worry about that baby yeah that's a so, good point though the cops are outside like did he just sneak right on by like, it, it's it's straight i mean i don't know if it's like meant to be it's behind the house it's whatever you know yeah. like I, th- this is one of those things that i can just sort of pretty easily buy into because it makes like the movie a little more interesting and better but <laughs> it is a little when you try and get into the nitty gritty of like, what the fuck is going on with Peter in this moment? It's like, I don't know. Actually, this is pretty weird. Yeah. <laughs> well, there is there's one cop out front that that he's is dead. killed. He's so dead, he right? maybe. Yeah, he's right. probably already maybe, dead. So maybe yeah. he saw the dead body. I don't know. Right. But like, yeah. do you think Peter saw the dead cop and he's just like, right. just walked by and, and went into. <laughs> well, right. if anything, he probably would have seen the killer cut the cop's throat because he's just standing outside peering in like, right. where's Jess? Yeah. You know, so then next, so we see the cops show up. They see the uh, one cop that's dead. They go into the basement and they find her with uh, Peter's dead body right there. And I would like to think or hope that maybe she's like, oh, well, I don't really think he's the killer, but this is the one chance I'll have at at (laughs) taking this guy out. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm going to get free and clear of this maniac. (laughs) So is she like pretty like 95 to 100 percent certain that he's the killer at this point because that's pretty bold to just or d- like or is it imply I, that he got really aggressive with her aggressive enough that she's f- frightened for her life I, I think that the combination of the way that he's been treating her just over the past couple of mm-hmm. days and then the stress of these phone calls and the stress of this particular moment of she's trying to trace this call. She keeps having to get back on it over and over again. The cop overheard the thing about her baby that she's going to maybe like go get aborted. And like, I think all of these things swirl around into she literally just saw her murdered friends, mm-hmm. just had her hair pulled by a very real person. And now Peter is literally forcing his way into the house yeah, and like yeah. trying to come talk more about the baby. I I don't know if she necessarily thinks. I don't know that she's putting all of it together and going like he's the guy on the other end of the phone. So and he just killed my friend, so I should kill him now. Or if it's just all of the stress of all of that at once and him yeah. being aggressive enough to come through the window mm-hmm. and keep coming at her about this just leads to that you know uh, yeah. response. That was really aggressive of him to just like. Yeah. Let me break the window. the window. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I so I think, you know, I think whether she necessarily thinks that he is in fact the voice or not, I definitely buy that all of this stuff amounts to her feeling like he's threatening her in that moment, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And he is unfortunately for him in the middle of all, of all the terrible timing for him really the oh, whole yeah. movie. He is undone 
again by his own stupidity <laughs> so, <laughs> for sure yes so, it's like this really i mean it's my favorite thing about this movie like it, having watched it a bunch of times it's like oh peter's fate is his own like yeah. <laughs> he really fucking sealed the deal on that like he gaslit her into like feeling threatened by him in that moment you know mm -hmm. what i mean well i just think in a, a good rule is to never tell someone you'll be sorry right <laughs> like, yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When we find out too, when that that cop is dead outside, that's a cool shot as yeah. well. It's, it's I uh, think the only real gore shot in the movie, actually, yeah, of it's, his it's, slit throat. It's kind of like we get, we get like this low sort of dolly shot of the cop car. And don't you hear radio like revealing to the cop that the call is inside the house or something yeah. at that point? Yeah. So so you kind of just see the top of his head. You're like, okay, they're telling this cop he's going to do something. The camera raises up and it reveals that he has a slit throat. Yeah. So I don't know. Cool shot. It is like a cool shot. One. Yeah. So at the end of all this, they give Jess a sedative to relax, let her sleep. And then Mr. Harrison sitting there kind of really not doing much of anything for the last, like, I don't know, half hour or more of the movie. He faints. Yeah. And then they have to take him to the hospital to make sure he's okay. Yeah. And then everyone kind of leaves the house, except for there's one cop that's outside. Yeah. Then we hear like the laughter of the of the voice and then we get some like final shots inside the attic where they still haven't found those two bodies yet yeah what a cool sequence of shots those last like yes. you know two or three shots are and, yeah, the, and the sound the, design too just like oh, like yeah you kind of gradually start hearing the voice and then you kind of start gradually hearing the phone ring and it gets louder and louder it's just really Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I love awesome. the way the credits roll over the phone, just getting like just louder, getting louder and louder. And mm -hmm. It's louder. interesting. I I I watched it with uh with the captions. Um, oh yeah, and I, I turned them on about halfway through, and it actually I didn't realize how much was actually being said on the phone. Like yeah, that yeah. that was pretty revealing. Uh, but the uh, the caption for phone ringing actually came in before you could even hear the phone ringing. So it was like that like, faint, yeah. and you just like <laughs> you just hear it coming in. But what well, it's interesting though, like. They just leave one cop outside and leave her in a crime scene, basically. Is yeah, that standard yeah. procedure? <laughs> it like, definitely feels weird. Yeah, It all feels at, a little weird. They're just, uh, at this point, they're assuming Peter is the killer, which in fairness is is a fair assumption. Yeah. But yeah. what, like... Right, as far as they're concerned, they don't need to investigate. I think what we are supposed to believe as the audience is, as far as they're concerned, they have caught the killer, and so... This is no longer like a dangerous place for Jess to be. She's not in danger. Yeah. But right. I feel like it would at least motivate them to search the rest of the house a little bit better. <laughs> right. I'm just, yeah. I'm just imagining these cops being like, oh, there's like a lot of, there's a lot of stairs. Yeah. Uh, I mean, again, I thankfully go Nash is the dumbest cop in the history of movies. <laughs> and so all you have to do is assume that he was leading this part of the investigation. <laughs> yeah, pretty much fine. buys the whole thing. Yeah. Well, it's also um, you get that shot at the end where you see like the, I think Claire's face like is in the window of the one yes. uh, of the attic. And then you just see the cop standing around and I was just like, is he at some point going to recognize that there's oh there's a head in that window oh it's it, dead. it does seem very obvious from the outside as we follow it out <laughs> you know you can kind of kind of see it pretty prominently there um but yeah it's like we were talking about earlier you know the the twist the surprise really isn't that the call's been inside the house because we're kind of clued into this as the audience but I was pretty surprised my first time watching it yesterday that we just find out nothing about the killer and that it's yeah. just like a guy up there. I thought that was so cool. Like I just yeah. like mm -hmm. I felt like pretty shocked by that. And then the credits start going. I was like, whoa, yeah, that was cool. I know. I think it's like a very chilling ending that it's like uh, he's just he's still in the house. Just, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. They're know. talking to himself. Yeah. Like this. This is not over necessarily, yeah. you know? Uh, so, so far in this series, we've seen Peeping Tom, Psycho, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Very good movies. Yeah. So how would you uh, relate these to like, what are some tropes you're noticing between these movies so far? Uh, it's interesting. With, with Peeping Tom, we kind of got the whole thing from, you know, the main character's perspective, from the killer's perspective, and we knew a lot about him. With Psycho, you know, you didn't, it was kind of like, uh, who is the killer figuring mm -hmm. out? you know who the identity is and then texas chainsaw massacre it's like 
you know, you, you know who this guy is kind of the whole time or his background doesn't matter. It's not like a matter of like, who is the killer? It's like yeah. the, the guy with the, the flesh mask and the chainsaw is the killer. So <laughs> I think, you know, this is probably most closely comparable to psycho. I would say, um, mm -hmm. as far as kind of the mystery behind who the killer is, um, yeah, I don't know. I just I I feel like it fits really well into the package of films we've already seen, and it's mm -hmm. I just, like I said before. I, I just think it's so cool that it's just like we don't really get a backstory. He's just some creepy guy. We don't really even see him. Mm -hmm. um, but then this obviously opens the door to more of the uh, perspective, the killer perspective thing, and we we got yep. that a little bit in Peeping Tom, and we'll get it more in you know Friday the Thirteenth and films Halloween. like that. Halloween's yeah, Halloween. got that famous opening sequence. And we haven't mentioned it. I, I I think it's common knowledge. I'm not sure. But I guess that the Bob Clark gave the idea for Halloween to John Carpenter. I read yeah, that, this yeah. Is, this is according to Bob Clark, by the way. <laughs> That's to, be, to, be, this is, <laughs> to be fair. Bob Clark says that John Carpenter was like, hey, I liked your movie. If you were going to make a sequel, what would it be? And he says, oh, this killer would escape from a mental asylum and attack the whole town and it would happen on Halloween. And of course, you know, then John Carpenter makes yeah. Halloween. Now, this is according yeah. to Bob Clark. Yeah. Well, that is that's like, you know, a pretty believable yeah. follow up to this yeah. film. Mm -hmm. so it makes sense to me that that would function as a as a sequel. It, it, it seems maybe a little more likely to me that that perhaps the the babysitter murder script that uh was supposedly floating around and Carpenter kind of turned into Halloween. He he maybe at least saw Black Christmas and was like, I like this holiday idea. You know, yeah. like <laughs> I, I think I could tack that onto my movie. It's oh it's always so funny with um it and it's always older directors how they will have all these stories and I feel like the older a person gets, the less you can really believe them fully about their like recollection of a of an event that occurs. A lot of self mythologizing in yes. Hollywood, <laughs> in my opinion. Yeah. So, Gary, we have to ask you: Would do you think you would survive this killer? Would I? No, yeah. I wouldn't survive any killer. Maybe the dumbest killer in the history of movies. I would not survive them. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, uh, I, definitely not. Uh, in no possible way. I, there, I would be too stupid to survive this killer. I would be physically incapable of surviving this killer. In every sense you could imagine, I would not survive this killer. So I was thinking about it. And with how quick he is at like just going into like kill mode. So like someone's like, oh, I hear a noise. Turn around. D dead. Yeah. I have terrible reaction time. I'm not very good at video games. So uh -huh. I know he would stab me, but now this might be just me trying to think like positively, but I feel like I could maybe try to squish him as I fall down. <laughs> so like maybe I wouldn't kill him, but I would make it very difficult. Like he's got to like push me off of him for him to get out and like... <laughs> If if I can at least hurt him in some way, I'd be satisfied, you know. So that's my that's my thought. I don't know. Maybe I'm thinking about this a little too much. But uh, <laughs> Jason, what about you? Uh, yeah, I would survive. Um, I first of all, I'm I'm thinking I'm probably not gonna be in this situation for starters in a sorority um, house. Yeah, I wouldn't be in the sorority even if we. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be in a fraternity. I I have likely picked my class schedule so that I'm already on break. Uh, yeah. Honestly, so <laughs> it, there's a good chance I'm just no. dead home. Um, so <laughs> I'm gonna go with with yeah, I would survive for those reasons. Okay, well, <laughs> I, I, that's a great answer. That I would uh, see. Uh, this is how you know I wouldn't have survived him. I was too stupid to think of the answer. I would go on vacation instead. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know that I would take way too long to pack up to leave, so I'd probably be one of the last people in the house. Yeah, yeah. this is um, true. And I've, yeah, yeah you're, you're, you tell me what time you're going to be visiting me, and I know I got a couple hours past that time to get some stuff done. Or we've had this situation before where I've stayed over at Jason's house, and he will leave for work, and he goes, "Yeah, just lock up when you're done," and then like. He like texts me at like two. He's like, did 
did you leave yet? And I was like, I just woke up. Sorry, man. I'll, I'll be leaving soon. <laughs> uh-huh. Makes no <laughs> so difference to me. But... <laughs> well, you're just like, well, I'm going to come be coming home soon. So. Yeah, I'll just say bye to you when I get home. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, any last thoughts on the movie? The, I, this is like between this and Halloween, they're like my kind of go to my number one slashers and really just like whichever one is the one I watched most recently <laughs> is probably like my favorite slasher, you know? <laughs> I, I, I think they're both just like that good. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Every time I watch this movie, I think it's like a better movie than yeah. the last time I watched I, it. I was just overall very surprised at the the very deliberate filmmaking, yeah. the quality of the acting and the mm-hmm. characters. And yeah, I mean, a, a pleasant surprise for me being the first time I watched it. I'm actually I'm excited to watch it again. And I think, you know, I might be with Garrett. It's a it's a good uh good movie to watch at Christmas time and a little twisted, but you know. Hell yeah. Garrett, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It was a pleasure. pleasure. This is so fun. I really enjoyed being here. This is great. All right. Well, that does it for this week's episode. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. And next week we will be reviewing Halloween. So until next week, stabulator. John is is Peter our first weenie of the new miniseries? Oh I don't yeah, know. He, he's a he's a <laughs> huge weenie. Oh man, what a boy! You nailed it. I mean, I, I've seen this movie so many times. Never thought to call him a weenie, and you just he just lasered in on exactly how to describe this character. He's a real fucking weenie.